Thank you. It's wonderful to see a full house here. I can assure you Karen Kane likes nothing better than a full house. Uh, the terrific thing about being asked to introduce Karen Kane is that you don't really have to do very much because everybody, at least in this country and in the ballet world, knows who Karen Kane is. However, for those of you who just might be suffering temporary amnesia, I should, you, I should remind you that even in her early 20s, she was being referred to as prima ballerina. Uh, the interviewer who made that reference was quickly chastised by Karen, who said, no, it's too soon to call me that. Uh, but it wasn't very long after before everybody considered a prima ballerina. Uh, Karen was, of course, Canada's ballet sweetheart from very early on. She was a standout in the corps de ballet when she joined in 1969, um, and she very soon rose to fame internationally. Uh, she had two books written about her before she'd even turned 30. She published her own autobiography in 1974, when she decided finally re to retire from the National Ballet in 1997, she was accorded the unprecedented honor of an official coast-to-coast -coast farewell tour, uh, which actually occurred in Winnipeg on the 4th of October 1997. I was there, uh, so was the mayor of Winnipeg, among others, and it was also a full house. And the National Ballet, in fact, were in Winnipeg for the first time since that farewell appearance of Karen, just recently on tour. So it was a, a kind of a, a nice little circle happening there. The thing a lot of people don't know about Karen Kane, however, is that apart from being a stellar ballerina, she always had a wider perspective. Uh, Karen has been involved in a range of charitable volunteer positions. She was president of the Kidney Foundation. She's been involved with the Toronto Humane Society. Uh, she's been a spokesperson for Plan Canada. And very notably, she was, for the first 12 years of its existence, the president of the Dancer Resource Transition Center, which is an organization close to her heart. She's still chair of the advisory council that helped dancers in the difficult process of moving from the stage to another career at what, for most people, would be considered a rather early age, often early 30s to 40s, when they have to sort of really reorganize their whole life. And that's been a big passion of Karen's. How she's found time to do all this is, these things is beyond me. A few other things on a personal note I can tell you about Karen. She's a great cat lover. In fact, I believe she likes all kinds of animals. Um, and she shares a birthday with, among others, Let's see, Santa Teresa de Avila, the British actor Dirk Bogard, and Lady Gaga. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Kane. We're now, we're now, oh, you can hear me, that's good. There's a gentleman at the back working the board and he said, speak up so I can get the level set. Um, this session is gonna be a shameless promotion for the 60th anniversary of the National Ballet of Canada. Uh, Karen's prime reason for being here is to remind you that she has a very important 60th anniversary season starting on November the 16th. And I know from experience because I've done a number of these kinds of talks with Karen, is that she much prefers to talk about the company than about herself. Although, of course, her own life is quite extraordinary and full of enormously interesting stories. But we'll probably get to some of those. But I thought an interesting place to start this conversation. This book, uh, Passion to Dance, the National Ballet of Canada, is hot off the press. It's by a very distinguished, uh, now retired professor from Trent University, James Newfeld, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book. He originally wrote this book under a different title, Power to Rise, in 1995, and this is the revised, expanded edition which brings it right up to date. And Karen has a foreword, and in describing the great endeavor of the National Ballet, let me just find this passage. She acknowledges the ups and downs, the elation and struggle, the ongoing effort and sheer determination, da 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 da. She says, it's a story of sweat, ingenuity, love, high purpose, courage, and belief. And I thought perhaps a good place to start would be to ask you, Karen, the thing that intrigued me was your choice of the words high purpose. Well, what does that mean for you as director of the National Ballet of Canada? Wow, uh, I'm still getting over Lady Gaga. <laughs> 
I had no idea. I always learned something from you, Michael. Um, higher purpose. Uh, I just believe that the arts play a higher purpose in society, and I believe that I have been incredibly uh, lucky to have been able to live the life of an artist, and now my purpose is to uh, continue to provide the kind of atmosphere and the kind of the proper ingredients to allow a cultural institution that formed me and gave me my life as a dancer. It is up to me to provide the ingredients to continue to make that institution serve the people of Canada and uh, and represent um, the culture that we have in this country around the world, if I can get us there. Um, so that's the higher purpose. Um, it's it's not about um, an ego. I really feel I really feel that it's. Uh, something that I have been um, training to do my entire life and that I've been lucky enough to be given uh, some guardianship of a great cultural institution and you know I'm going to do my very best just like everyone who came before me in this position and I worked with them all uh, did and, and allowed me what what I had and uh, what I enjoyed, but it's all, it all, what I enjoyed seems like a distant memory now. What's important to me is, um, is, as I say, just providing an experience for the public and for the artists of this generation. Um, I'm interested, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you officially retired from the National Ballet in 19... 97, you did in fact do a number of, of engagements with Netherlands Dance Theatre 3 and so on for another year. I mean, and then finally, I think it was the fall of 1998, you basically hung up your point shoes for good. And you went back to the National Ballet. Um, was it first as artist in residence or associate, whatever, a, a title which artist gave... Artist in residence. The artist in residence, which basically allowed you a, a fairly wide field of operation within the company. And then finally, when James Kadelka resigned in 2005 and you became artistic director, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, and I made reference, in fact, to the Dancer Transition Center, Resource Center, uh, what was your own transition like from, from prima ballerina, dancer, the star of the company, to a very different kind of role where you're not on stage and, in a sense, the buck stops on your desk? I mean, how has that transition been? Uh, again, um, because I was allowed to um, make the decision myself about how my career would phase out, um, I, I had the, a gift that a lot of dancers don't get because often their career is taken away from them either by the fact that their body betrays them and they're injured and they can't do it anymore or they, they don't meet the criteria of the current artistic director and you know there's lots of reasons but it isn't always that a dancer gets to decide um, I'm going to stop now and then you know you have the time or in my case I went to Reed Anderson who was the artistic director then who's now in Stuttgart as the artistic director and uh, I told him, and, and part of that was motivated by the fact that Garth Drabinsky, who's now in jail, um, <laughs> came to me and said, whenever you are thinking of, of retiring, let me know because I would like to provide a tour for you to, to finish your career. So I, I had that opportunity because it was something that the National Ballet couldn't really afford to put together a whole tour. just. To, to give me a chance to go across the country. So um, I had that, I had, and I thought, wow, what an opportunity for me to say goodbye to everyone who's followed my career for all these years. And, you know, the National Ballet used to go one year west across Canada, one year east across Canada. So Canadians across the country had seen me grow up and, and had watched me through my career. So I had that and I went to read and he kept saying, are you sure, are you sure? And up until the press conference, about a year and a half later, where I, I announced that this was going to be my, my farewell tour, he kept 
wanting me to be sure that it was. Now, reed comes from the European tradition, and dancers um, seem, a lot of ballerinas seem to dance a lot longer in Europe. It's a, it's a different system. There's a lot more support and pension and, you know, all those things that, that we don't have here. I don't necessarily think that that's always a good thing, um, but I was very lucky to have um, been given the opportunity to, to make up my own mind that it was that it was time for me to stop and then to be given the tour and what was the question again <laughs> about about your own transition from being a dancer a prima ballerina to to ending up leading the company um, a, okay. a different kind of role yeah and then I had this incredible opportunity that year year she Killian called me and said would you like to come and perform with uh, Netherlands Dance Theatre for, for the over 40s. He had a company for dancers over 40. And I was the youngest member of the company. <laughs> it was fun. And I spent a year um, traveling back and forth and working with them and ha learning new repertoire that was created specifically for dancers. I was replacing Martine Van Hamel, who had been part of the first uh, founding of that company, and she passed on some of her roles to me. And I was doing some galas here and there and everywhere. And then I, I hurt myself quite badly. I, I tore a ligament in my foot. And I really thought, I think, you know, I think God's really telling me it's time. So, and James Kadelka had invited me back. So I came back and, you know, it was, it was everything just unfolded in a way that guided me back to the National Ballet. And then I started um, rehearsing some things and I was uh, constantly in meetings, learning behind the scenes in management meetings and, uh, I didn't really realize that I was in training for the next step of my life, but in fact, I was. So again, um, serendipity, good luck, uh, people who were looking out for me and guiding me, and uh, that the transition for me, uh, giving up dancing is not easy for anyone, but I really, really couldn't do it anymore. And I, I knew that, and I had my own standards that I could no longer achieve and uh, I, I knew I had to let it go but there is there was a, a year of um, you know that everyone goes through it's a kind of grieving process um, so but I had witnessed that grieving process my entire life including in school because a lot of my colleagues that I trained with in the ballet school didn't make it to be professionals and I had watched uh, the pain they had gone through. And again, I knew I was lucky. From the moment I graduated from the school and I was offered a contract with the National Ballet, and many of my friends and colleagues were not, um, and I, I knew how lucky I was. And so that was what really made me want to be involved with the Dancer Transition Resource Center was because that pain, no matter when you give up dancing, there is a definite pain and grieving process that you have to go through, whether you're a student or whether you're a professional with many years of experience. And uh, I knew there were, there were ways to help these people go through this. And the Dancer Transition Center is celebrating its 25th anniversary, which is just astounding to me. So, the thing about being artistic director is, in common parlance, it is a role and a very important role, but as I said before, it's an offstage role. Um, were there any surprises in it for you? I mean, you, you, you'd had this kind of um, sort of uh, apprenticeship in a way, in the sense that you had the opportunity to observe very closely the way the company operates. But once you actually became artistic director, um, were there still some surprises for you? Definitely. Um, you know, you can be, you can, until you have the weight of responsibility on your own shoulders, you never really know how hard it is. And I even knew that as a dancer, because sometimes before I ever danced Aurora and Sleeping Beauty, and I was, you know, doing other roles, and I would watch it and think, well, that's not so hard, I could do that. And then when I actually <laughs> got my chance to do it, <laughs> like, oh my god, it's so hard, and it doesn't look that hard. Well, um, it, I'm not saying that being an artistic director looked easy to me, but 
you just don't know until the, the feeling of the, the weight of that responsibility 24-7 uh, um, and on so many levels, box office, repertoire, dancers, just there's a lot of stress and as a dancer you work off that stress by just working out really hard physically. What you can't do that as an artistic director. You can't just go and work out for three hours because you've got 20 meetings in those three hours. Um, so uh, the, I guess the biggest surprise was the feeling of that responsibility and the, the, um, the kind of stress which is very different than being um, an athlete artist kind of stress. And of course, uh, I, my grave oversight, I forgot to mention among your list of accomplishments that, that, that in 2004, you became chair of the Canada Council for the Arts, which you continued doing beyond your appointment as artistic director right out of the company right up until 2008. How on earth did you manage to juggle that? Uh, I, I look back now, I don't know how. I, I, I really, um, I, I accepted the job uh, as chair of the Canada Council before there was any indication that um, James would leave. That was a complete surprise. He, he still had, uh, a year, at least a year in his contract and I mean he told me every day of his nine years as artistic director that he hated the job every single day so for all of us so it went in one year out the other I mean we never it was like crying wolf too many times so when he actually um, stepped down that was a, a, a real shock to, to everyone um, wh where was I going with this well, how you juggled this, because oh, I mean, you, so you became already, chair of the council yes. at a very critical time. So I'd already accepted to do the chairmanship of, of the council because I was already feeling that I had learned a lot and I was um, kind of biding my time at the National Ballet. It wasn't feeding me, it wasn't interesting enough anymore. I needed to do more. And then when, I, when they came and asked me to do this, I thought, I can make a contribution to the country for all the artists in the country, for all the disciplines, not just dance. Uh, that, that's what I, I'd hope, I hope to do. And I, I uh, talked to my husband about it and they had said it was a three-year term and we discussed it and I said, you know, I really feel that this would be inspiring for me and that I could make a difference there and hopefully get some more money for the Canada Council in general and, you know, and uh, so he agreed, okay, three years, I guess we can, <laughs> we can do this. And then it came out and he, I will never forget sitting at the breakfast table with my coffee and my husband with the newspaper saying, they say it's a five year term. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a total surprise to me. <laughs> so I guess it was only uh, a year into my term at the Canada Council, and it was a very exciting year. It was unbelievably exciting. If you remember that Lisa Frula was the Minister of Heritage and that she truly believed that the Canada Council should have its budget uh, doubled, and she was like no minister has been before or since as far as I know. She was going to push this through. Um, and, and in fact, it was announced and then the, the, they lost the election and I thought, I mean, I was very, very depressed at that point. I thought there would be nothing for the Canada Council and uh, fortunately, uh, a 30 million was added to the base of the Canada Council by the, the new Conservative government and, you know, it wasn't the 150 million I thought I was celebrating and thought we might get. But it was 30 million, and so the budget went up from 150 to 180, and um, I was very proud of that. But um, I kept trying to leave the Canada Council, and my colleagues kept begging me to stay, and I, I gave in for a while, and then I finally said, I cannot finish five years. I finished three years, and, and I... And you got them over the hump. I, yes, I did. Yeah, and you got um, them over the hump. Yes. So, Another word you used here in describing the endeavor of the company is uh, ingenuity. And you were talking a little earlier about when you were sort of describing the experience of being artistic director, uh, of you know, all the, the different burdens that now rest on your shoulders. I mean, there's audience, there's box office, there's keeping dancers happy, there's thinking about repertoire. I mean, 
where does the ingenuity come in in balancing these things? Because surely it is a kind of a balancing act. Well, budgets. You know, uh, how can you keep, as I talked about, the public interested and the artists interested, and um, with, you know, with new work, with old work, um, the combinations that are going to be exciting for people, getting new work mostly, I guess. I guess I realized that through my entire career, starting with Celia Franca, we always did contemporary work and we always did classical work. And for me, working with the choreographers who came in was the most exciting, gratifying thing, being part of the creative process, feeling like, like you owned a, a role in a production that was brand new and that you got to create. And so that the ingenuity, I, and, and I always think of Celia, um, how you figure out the give and take of budgets and how much box office and will you make your, um, your goals. And, um, and if you do and there's a surplus, then the surplus can go towards a new work. And, you know, um, and, and if you're in, in trouble, you pick a piece of repertoire that you know will fill the house because it's an old favorite of everybody's. And I don't know, that kind of ingenuity. And the, I don't know, just mapping out the future and then crossing your fingers that your map is going to be accurate. And of course, it never is exactly accurate because there's always things that happen in the economy or in the weather. In, you know, I remember a snowstorm that in the middle of Nutcracker that, that meant that most of the audience didn't it, make it. The artists all made it, the, the musicians all made it, we all made it, but a lot of people didn't come. And two sold out houses of Nutcracker were only, you know, a quarter full and then we wanted to, we offered tickets to all the people that had missed out because of the snowstorm, but in doing so, we were down thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars because we couldn't then sell those tickets that we had given to the people who missed. So um, that we couldn't have foreseen that a snowstorm would set us back $200,000 in the season, but, but it did. Now we don't give tickets. If you miss the show, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but of course, the other thing that a lot of people tend to forget is although they, they might look at the absolute numbers in terms of uh, public investment in the arts, or say specifically in the National Ballet of Canada, relative to your overall budget, it actually keeps diminishing. I mean, I can remember when you were a dancer, it probably accounted for a third of the budget. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't even account for a quarter. So I guess that makes box office much, much more critical for you. It, it is it, it incredibly critical. It is, um, if, I mean, it, it's almost, it's getting close to half of our budget. If we, you know, if we don't get our goals in box office, that's really, really a, a scary thing. It's almost like, it's almost like commercial theater, I guess, where uh, we just don't have the subsidy that we used to have, and even the the subsidies we have from, you know, there are they're being threatened daily. <laughs> um, we had a big scare recently that we were going to lose the money from the city, and we still might lose it, and we still might be cut. Um, at least, you know, we're. We're starting to think we'll be lucky if we get away with a 10% cut, which is really hard to replace because we have so many generous individuals who step up every single year for us, and everybody who buys a ticket is, is supporting us. So um, it, it's, a, it's a scary time, yeah. And yet, uh, knowing all this, you have been what I would consider from my seat fairly aggressive in your programming in terms of not compromising your own artistic ambitions. I mean, I think back to that wonderful program, you'll probably remember, was it March of 2009 when you did the innovations? Yeah. Karen programmed, and it was totally unprecedented in the history of the National Ballet, a triple bill, as they say, three works, all new ballets, all by Canadian choreographers, two of those ballets with original scores, commissioned scores. I mean, this is your board must have thought you were off your rocker. Not so much my board as my artistic and production team. 
<laughs> because usually when we do new work, we work with one artistic team. So one choreographer, one lighting designer, one costume designer. But now we had three. Three, you know, driving the wardrobe crazy, driving the production director crazy, you know, all with these demands and, and, the, and inexperience because they were young. Uh, so, no, I, I, I almost had a mutiny <laughs> behind the scenes from, from using three creative teams. It's much easier to use one creative team, and even that is stressful enough. Um, you did it. But my board, they don't always realize those complications, and quite frankly, I didn't expect it to be quite so difficult. Um, but I was working with a costume designer who was used to um, making her costumes on her kitchen table, and, and she wasn't used to uh, dealing with a professional wardrobe department that needed, you know, kind of that kind of instruction, that kind of level. She just wanted to do it herself in her kitchen, and you know, <laughs> my wardrobe people want to, they have great pride in, in their professionalism, and they need to be told how you want them to do it, then they want to do it. So I, I had to put out a lot of fires around that behind the scenes uh, that I didn't expect. But of course, the, the result was it was an artistic, I mean, even, even if all three ballets weren't uh, as successful in terms of critical response or whatever, which really doesn't matter, I mean, the excitement in the audience was terrific, which does tell you that there is an appetite for innovation. It isn't only the Sleeping Beauties and then the Swan Lakes and... Oh, I, I have actually been really heartened by the response of our audiences to the new work. That they've really started to um, take the chance of coming to these programs that are that they don't recognize any of these titles and they don't know what they're going to get and they discover things about um, choreographers they've never heard of and they see different sides of the artists and they discover artists that they hadn't seen before and they are really, um, their curiosity has been piqued and they're, they're really coming along uh, to see all of this. I mean, you know, when I brought in Chroma by Wayne McGregor, which is coming back in, in June, I had no idea what the audience would do because it's really, it's really out there, primitive, mm, primitive, amazing, wonderful, but um, not what anyone would ever think of as ballet. And uh, but it requires these highly trained, articulate, incredible dancers to do it, and the music is inspired by some rock, white stripes music, which I think is really beautiful. I mean, I love the score, but I just didn't know what people would think and how they would react and if they, you know. They went crazy. They loved it. Couldn't it was get great. It yeah. was great. It was really wonderful. That's why I'm bringing it back. <laughs> Phew, they loved it. It's great. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, um, I know what one of the, the big projects for the 60th anniversary year is um, a new production of uh, a ballet which has been in the repertoire for a long, long time, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a new production, um, Romeo and Juliet to the Prokofiev score. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, to be choreographed by uh, a Russian um, choreographer who now lives in New York City, Alexei Ratmansky. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of this, your decision, first of all, to, to do a new production of Romeo and Juliet after 46 years. 46 years. Mm -hmm. uh, what that entails, uh, and perhaps what drew you to Alexei Rechmansky, um, and perhaps what we can expect uh, when, it, uh, when the curtain goes up on it November the 16th to a full house. <laughs> um, well, I guess, I mean, it's a production that I love, that, that I'm extremely fond of, and uh, the, the, the old one. Um, that I've watched since I was in the ballet school and have danced in and have seen every artist who ever has danced it. And it's, it's a very, very beautiful production. It's the oldest production that we have in the repertoire, I believe, that we're still performing. Um, and it is, a, it is a production of its time, 
which was more than 46 years ago. We, we just got it 46 years ago. And it was created for specific artists of that time, and it was created for the level of dancer that was then. And so in, for me, it's a production that basically has four or five wonderful principal characters who carry the whole thing, and the rest of the company uh, is just kind of decoration in the way that old productions used to do. So it doesn't demand much of them except being involved in the action and filling in space between the important parts. So um, I felt that the, the company we have today is so full of extraordinary artists who can dance the pants off any, any dancers anywhere. And that um, to do a production where, for instance, if you're um, one of the in, the, in the old production, there were women who waited around three hours to dance for four minutes in the final scene. Um, and, and other people who were finished after act one, other people who were finished after act two, of course, that's the story. I mean, people die at the end of act two. Um, <laughs> But it was only, uh, as an artist, it was only a rewarding experience for Romeo, Juliet, Mercutio, Tybalt, and Lady Capulet. Everyone else were just basically decoration or filler. And I felt uh, now is the time to mark a, a, an anniversary of this company with, uh, with a new production. And I chose Alexei because I think he's one of the most brilliant choreographers working today. But he is not, he's a traditionalist. He respects, he, he respects ballet, he respects the, 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 uh, the actual ballet steps, but he puts them together in a way that appears to be completely unexpected. But they're still ballet steps. So he isn't, he, he would never call himself a modern or contemporary choreographer. He's a traditionalist, but his talent is such that it looks new and interesting and demanding, incredibly demanding on everyone. And what he has done so far, I think is just fantastic. And the whole company is dancing. And the scenes, the level of drama, and there's no, there's no long periods of time where the scenery is changing and the music is playing and everybody can just kind of, there is, there is dancing every note of the ballet. Um, he's about 60% finished at this point. Um, and I've been, yes, I, I just thought, this is the time to mark the company that we have today with a production that suits them, that is created for them, on them, that they own. Um, and now we just cross our fingers and hope that it works. But of course, Karen Kane, the strategist, is also at work here because you, I'm sure you realize that, that acquiring a Romeo and Juliet for the company by an A-list choreographer um, puts you in a enhanced competitive position in terms of touring opportunities. And in fact, I believe I'm correct in saying that Sadler's Wells Theatre in London is already bringing the company to London with the Romeo and Juliet, not even before it's even premiered, uh, which is a testament to their respect for the National Ballet of Canada, but, But also, I mean, let's face it, they could have invited you a long time ago based on that respect for the company, but, but acquiring yeah. this new Ratmansky Romeo and Juliet is your ace card. Well, I have to tell you, so far, one of, one of the highlights of my time as artistic director was to sit with Alistair, Alistair Spaulding, who runs the Sadler's Wells Theatre in London, and to tell him that I was planning a new production of Romeo and Juliet with Alexei Ratmansky and Richard Hudson. And this is a very British gentleman who doesn't show anything, very calm, collected. His jaw dropped <laughs> and he spun around and faced me and said, what a coup, how did you do that? And I was, I, I wanted to turn and high five my executive director, but I thought maybe it was inappropriate, so I, um, he said, 
those names, uh, Richard Hudson is most famous for Lion King, but he's done many, many, many productions, the, the, um, the designer. I said, well, I, 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 w I worked on Alexei for three years. I mean, he wanted to do it immediately, but he, he had so many productions lined up. He never stops. Um, and Richard Hudson was suggested to me by Monica Mason at the, at the Royal Ballet, so I, um, because I was looking for a new look, a new, a new designer, but one with lots of experience, because they, it had to be special. And he said, on the strength of those names, I want, I want the company, I, you know. And then, he, and then I said, but I want another program with Canadian choreographers on it. He said, fine, we'll do two programs. So, so we're going. And, and uh, I have the same invitation for New York uh, to take Romeo and Juliet on the strength of the choreographer and the designer. Mm -hmm. All you need is the funding to do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's but I sad, can do it. <laughs> it's an, it's an, unfortunate, an unfortunate fact that... that Canada invests a great deal of money, relatively speaking, quite a lot of taxpayers' money in, in sustaining performing arts organizations, but then when they reach a level of excellence, such as the National Ballet, uh, they haven't given very much thought to actually sending them abroad so other countries can see what a good job we do. Um, and the little money that even did exist has now disappeared. Um, so it makes it extremely difficult for companies to tour, despite the invitations. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of places in the States would love to have you but they can't, they can't afford to offer the money it would need to bring the company. Yes, but what I, what I believe is that there are people on the board of the National Ballet of Canada that believe that this company should be seen and believe, I mean, it's, it's part of the strategy that I express to them from day one, that the National Ballet of Canada needs to be recognized on the world stage. It used to be, it hasn't been for a long time, and we have to get it back out there. And the way we have to get it back out there is by doing unique and interesting repertoire that other major cities want to see. And I think that, you know, I, again, I was given the privilege of an international career when the National Ballet used to tour. And these young artists, they're, they're, stuck, they're stuck in Toronto. It's a great place to be stuck. But any artist in any discipline, if they're really good, they want to have an international career. And it's part of also keeping them. I can't, all, I can't keep them all, but I can keep a lot of really good ones if they know that they're going to have a national career and an international career. So that's all part of the strategy. The artistic director who hired you into the National Ballet in 1969 once described, Celia Franco, once described the job of artistic director to me as a job she wouldn't wish on her worst enemy. Um, mm -hmm. You have talked about the burdens of the role. Um, perhaps we could conclude this part of, of, of the uh, evening by, by perhaps you sharing with us some of the things that, that just makes you go, yeah, you know, the things that you love about it. Because after all, you've been at it already. It was it's your sixth season now. Um, you know, if you wanted to say, OK, I've done my turn, somebody else could, but you haven't said that. So there must be something that really makes you want to keep going at it. Oh, I get uh, incredible satisfaction uh, watching the performances. I really do. You know, we've just come back from a, a tour across Canada. And by the way, Winnipeg, I didn't realize till I was there. Winnipeg, the performance that we did in Winnipeg after 14 years was on October the 4th. Like, <laughs> the, the circle. Um, every single show, the audience stood and screamed for the company. And I could see the dancers just feeling that energy and that appreciation of what they had done. And we, we had two brilliant Canadian choreographers on the program, and one work by William Forsyth, which is pretty demanding on the audience, and then one beautiful, more classical work by Jerome Robbins. So it was a, you know, it was a really eclectic program. But for the two Canadian choreographers, they were on their feet screaming, and, it, and that was really gratifying. For me, you know, just that, to feel that response from the public for those artists uh, gives me so much satisfaction. So that's the best part. And then, you know, the other part is when someone like Alistair Spaulding says, I'll bring it on, you know. Um, 
Yeah, and, and watching, the, um, watching young people get their first chances. I love, you know, kind of giving them the, the um, material to develop. And, and when you sort of first realize how extraordinarily talented some of them are, and they're just beginning to, to show it, um, no, it th that's, that's the best part of this job. Thank you. So it's at this point in the uh, proceedings that if anybody have questions for Karen um, or want to follow up on, on some of the things she's been saying, now is your opportunity. There is a mic uh, right there in the, in the center aisle. So if you have any questions, don't be shy. Uh, also, I should have mentioned, you, m many of you I'm sure have noticed, on the, the wall here, uh, the National Ballet has a display about the 60th anniversary. And it's going to be in this room, I think, for quite some time. But um, if you don't intend to be back in, in Toronto Reference Library for a while, you might want to look at it uh, afterwards before you leave.